Well, um, my name is uh, Ricardo Hausmann. I'm the director of Harvard's uh, Center for International Development. And it's a pleasure for me to be moderating this panel on the inclusive uh, economic growth. Uh, the issue of um, uh, economic growth has been um, at the forefront of debates over the last few years. But the substance of those debates have been uh, incredibly varied. And I'm pretty sure that um, <coughs> uh, when the, the, this panel was designed and put together, the ideas, uh, the concerns were different from the concerns we have in the world today. Two years ago, there was a horrible crisis and the world was growing at negative rates, for the first global recession ever. Uh, and now uh, the world is growing quite fast. It's true that um, some countries in the world, the US and part of Western Europe are not growing very fast, but South America is growing fast, Asia is growing very fast. And to some extent, the world is showing signs of overheating in the sense that energy prices are sky high, food prices are sky high, and that's creating problems for uh, inclusive growth. Uh, because you know the poor uh, spend disproportionately their money on on food. So, well, the issues were you know the region is growing, Latin America is growing. How do we make that growth inclusive? In some countries in Latin America, the problem has been lack of growth. So it's not the just the inclusiveness of growth, but the absence of growth. In other parts of Latin America, uh, growth has been uh, okay, but the inclusiveness has been lacking. We have an excellent panel uh, that is going to be able to shed light on different aspects of, this, of, of these sets of issues. So um, I'm going to uh, start the panel from the global uh, to the local, and from the macro issues to the more social issues. So for the global, I'm going to start with um, Bill Rhodes, who's, this is his first trip to Latin America. <laughs> No, I'm just joking. Uh, Bill has, has, uh, has a Latin American honorary citizenship. Uh, he uh, became the leading figure during the Latin American debt crisis in the 80s. Uh, he, has, uh, he speaks Spanish and Portuguese uh, fluently, thanks to all of the interactions he's had. He's um, a, a, the senior advisor of City. Uh, right now, and, and he just came out with a book called uh, The World, Banker for the World. No, Banker to the World. Banker to the World. <laughs> uh, that is, that I advise you to read it if you want to hear words of wisdom, especially uh, people in, in, uh, in South Europe uh, who might want to learn a lesson of two about financial crises and how to overcome them lessons that um, Bill has learned in Latin America. Bill, I'm going to ask you to, um, a, to, to a share with us how you're seeing a global growth and the challenges that the current pattern of global growth has for its inclusiveness. Well, I think you framed it uh, very well, Ricardo, when you said uh, that the uh, developed countries, uh, a number of them are having problems with growth, not only the peripheral in Europe, um, uh, the United States is having its own problems, and obviously Japan with the tragedy there. And the growth has really shifted uh, to the emerging markets. Brazil is a good example of that. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, uh, the world has to worry about here, we were just coming out of a great recession, is, uh, is inflation. Uh, we're seeing that as, as a major problem in China today. Premier Wen Jiabao has mentioned the tiger out of the cage uh, with a massive lending and stimulus there and how that's Im impacting uh, wages, et cetera. I think in the United States, uh, there's a tendency to underestimate food and energy, the impact there. And I think you've had massive flows into the emerging markets because of what, what's gone on in the develop, so-called developed world on the slow growth, no growth. And I think uh, countries are now faced with, Guido Montega uh, captured all of the headlines in Seoul, uh, Korea, at the G20, when he mentioned uh, the currency wars. And this puts a lot of pressure on central banks and governments as to how to tackle inflation. It's, it's, I think it's something that is being watched here very closely. Uh, capital controls have been used in a number of cases. 
And I would just say capital controls are easy to put on, but you got to make sure you don't leave them too long. And so I think this is a, this is a real danger worldwide is inflation, because as you point out, it cuts into growth, and particularly the growth of the poorer classes and uh, you know, the lower middle class. And so I think one of the areas that's being really underestimated as we come out of the Great Recession, particularly in the em emerging markets, is a question of inflation. Now, it's different in every country, but it's there. And what is the same is food and energy. It's, I think, and it's being underestimated by a lot of people because they say, oh, it's a problem of the Middle East. Food was not a problem uh, coming out of the problems in the Middle East. And it's not clear. A lot of that was demand driven uh, even before the Middle East came up with energy. So I think this is one of the things that I think is a clear and present danger to growth worldwide. Mm -hmm. Very good, yes. I mean, global growth is going at about 4.5%. Imagine if the U.S. and parts of Europe were not in a recession, what would oil and food prices be these days? So it's clear that the world is, is bumping against some, some growth limits. Now, one of the stars of the growth story is India. And we have the Minister of State for Commerce and Industry from India, Mr. Sindhya, here with us, who happens to be like many talented people. Another one here in the audience, in, in, the, in the panel, is a graduate from Harvard. So I, I'll take credit for any good things that he does. In, <laughs> India is a country that is seeing growth accelerate. It's been struggling with, um, with making that growth um, inclusive. Uh, two elections ago, the BJP was enjoying the perception of being extremely popular and so on with high growth, and they lost the election because of the perception that growth was not inclusive. And the government uh, of the Congress party has been very focused on making sure that that growth is inclusive. And part of it has to do with a conflict between uh, <coughs> making the rural areas richer, but providing the public goods that the urban areas need to grow. And in several places, people have lost the election because they've put the infrastructure in the urban areas, which is where much infrastructure is terribly needed, and then the rural areas get mad because they, don't, they feel they don't get enough attention. So uh, managing this inclusiveness of growth in India has been a challenge, and I would like you to share with us the wisdom of the lessons learned. Well, thank you, Ricardo. First of all, uh, just as every good politician, you're taking credit for the good stuff and not the liability for the bad stuff, which is great. Uh, I didn't know in the academic world one could do that, but one always <laughs> learns something new every day, but nevertheless. Um, well, first of all, it's a pleasure being here in, in, in Latin America, um, a continent that uh, holds a lot of promise for the, for the rest of the world. Um, you talked about the concept of inclusive growth, and uh, uh, I firmly believe that, uh, first of all, the raison d'etre of why inclusivity is extremely important, and I don't think the import of that is lost on, on any of us. I think if in any of our countries, we desire our uh, a population to perform to the maximum potential that they can uh, in, in the will of the nation good, then empowerment of our people and more than empowerment, I think what's really important is provision uh, of opportunity to every single citizen is extremely important. Now, if that's the goal, then there are two drivers to be able to achieve that. Uh, the first driver, of course, must and should be government in terms of provision of basic facilities, whether it's the social sector, health or education, uh, whether it's infrastructure, uh, across the board. The other is also being able to really uh, allow the private sector to flourish. And what I believe that, uh, that my country in many ways has achieved is really uh, the, the union of the two, the, the ability to be able to marry the qualities of the, of the government sector with that of the private sector to be able to power our nation ahead. Uh, India has experienced a tremendous amount of, of uh, decadal growth. If you uh, go back into our history of not too long ago, Ricardo and I were talking about uh, when, and Bill and I were talking about when liberalization started in India uh, in 1991, all of 19 years ago, 20 years ago, not too long ago. Uh, from that point onwards, India has assumed uh, a rate of close to 6.5% compounding over the last two decades. Now that's the story of India. And that story of empowerment of growth comes not only from urban ar areas, but also from rural areas. And let me give you a vignette of why I believe that's the case. The last year and a half has been an awful time for the world. 
But in India, even during the financial crisis, India experienced a growth rate of close to about 7.3%. And the reason why India was able to do that was because, unlike other economies, it was the rural economy that really powered that growth in India. The demand for products, whether it's FMCG products, across the board infrastructure products, really came from rural India. And if Ricardo's theory is true, wherein the rural areas uh, are disadvantaged to a great extent, how is that possible? That was possible because the government's face and policies for the last six and a half years have been about inclusivity, which means we cannot have islands of prosperity anymore in our country or I dare say in the rest of the world. We need to power that growth pyramid all the way down to the, to the last man. And that's only possible if your policies actually augur for that. And in India, we've instituted a number of programs, whether it's the uh, employment guarantee scheme, where we provide a 100 days worth of work for every single citizen who desires that in India. Uh, we've spent close to about $8 billion in terms of creating public assets through that scheme. Whether it's empowering citizens in our country through the Right to Information Act, where every politician and every bureaucrat is accountable to the public through that uh, uh, promulgation of law, whether it's the Right to Education Act, wherein we have promulgated that every child from the age of 6 to, six to 14 has to be provided elementary education. India is home to 17% of the world's population, but we are also home to 20% of the world's children. And that is a huge responsibility on us. And therefore, the Indian government views itself very seriously in terms of promulgating that process. Uh, we have a rural um, infrastructure program called Bharat Nirman, which is the new modern India, where we have, we're going to spend close to about $40 billion in terms of rural connectivity over a period of five years. So tremendous amount of funds, resources, piloted towards the social sector, towards infrastructure, whereas the private sector is doing its own. And therefore, that union or that marriage has been able to provide inclusive growth, or what we call in India, which is reforms with equity and equality and with a human face, which has resulted in, in India being where she is today on the world stage. Thank you very much. Um, we're now going to move uh, towards more macro issues in the region. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Luciano Coutinho, who's the president of BNDES, uh, as you know, BNDES is uh, a huge uh, national development bank. Uh, they pride themselves on saying that it is bigger than the World Bank. Um, it, is, um, it is a very innovative institution uh, that is a key aspect of long-term investment in, in Brazil. Brazil is, um, is a complicated uh, story to tell. Uh, there is a story out there that looks at Brazil as the next China, the, uh, um, the next growth superstar, part of the BRICS, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If you look at the record, uh, Brazil over the last decade has had one of the lowest rates of growth in all of Latin America. It grew a lot last year, but in part because it had grown very little the year before. This year it's growing at around four and a bit percent, and it's showing tremendous signs of overheating. So there's something that is telling us that at 4%, if you're overheating at 4%, it means that there's some structural limits uh, to, to growth. Um, uh, and, and people that have looked into the question have looked at the, at the fact that, in spite of the fact that Brazil has one of the highest tax revenues in the developing world, it has the lowest public investment rate uh, in the world. Uh, and it shows in the infrastructure, we all came through Brazilian airports, and we all went last night to this beautiful palace in, 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 in La Laranjia, or uh, through transported in Brazilian infrastructure. So, so we have seen the constraints under which this economy is operating in terms of, of, um, of the infrastructure. We also have heard of Bolsa Escola, Bolsa Familia, et cetera, where some nine billion reais are spent every year. We also know that some 48, bi no, some 48 billion reais are spent in, 
in subsidizing uh, the public sector um, pensions uh, for the uh, richer parts of, of, uh, of the society. So uh, this is a country where there are significant constraints to growth and there are significant constraints to redistribution. Uh, and in that context, I would like to see um, your, your ideas as, or, your, or the Brazil's plans as to how to have a more robust, sustainable growth that does not overheat and that uh, accelerates inclusion. Well, let me first uh, correct a bit that we were overheating when we were growing, growing aggregate demand growing around 10%. And now we, uh, as we all know, uh, have to moderate growth this year. And, but we need to increase aggregate savings and aggregate investment. So in order, in order to have a sustainable growth rate, uh, we should necessarily increase our savings, aggregate savings and investment towards 24, 25% of GDP, which means aggregate extra five percentage points of GDP in coming years, which is a big challenge. Now, uh, we do have a frontier of investment opportunities of high return that are, is a viable frontier, able to attract capital. And what we need is to place the right incentives for savings, create also the necessary uh, incentives for long-term uh, uh, finance, not just from our bank, which is already in the reach of its limit, but we have to, we have therefore to engage the private sector, engage the private banking capital markets, and what that's what we have already done by creating incentives but also uh, mobilizing the private sector to help increase investment in infrastructure, which is a line of uh, orientation already taken in many of the infrastructure sectors. And it is a, uh, a uh, focus of President Dilma's strategy particularly to the uh, bottlenecks in infrastructure. So we must raise our investment, aggregate investment, in order to create uh, more uh, sustainability, create sustainability for our growth. And we also need to keep the processes of income distribution, employment creation, economic inclusion, which were successful so far, but we now have a new challenge, not just to take care of the very poor strata, very the poorest part of the population, which is one of the main strategic investment of President Dilma, is to reduce extreme poverty in coming years, but also to create better conditions for the poorest overall, and that means access to public services, to education, to health, to housing, to water, to electricity, so far. They, this call for more investment in infrastructure, and this compounds the need for more investment. So I do uh, uh, agree that without maintaining a robust trajectory for investment, uh, there is no way, and that's why uh, we should privilege investment uh, as a strategic uh, decision and, and moderate uh, current expenditures and even consum and consumption expenditures. Uh, however, of course, it is also necessary that consumption grows, but it has to the, the uh, differential rates have to be we have to take care of those. So it is a challenge to coordinate that. But it is a viable, a viable challenge for the time being. You know? I just wanted to make some comments also about macro, global scenario, but I, I will leave it to, to, okay. another, to another round. Very good. Okay. Very good. Because I think there is, we have a, a difficult challenge, globally speaking, which is who is leading growth is emerging economies, led 
particularly China. You know, maybe it grew too much, but it was important for the health of the, of the global economy. If developing economies step in the break very abruptly to face inflation, uh, that may not be a very wise decision because developed economies will not grow in coming years or grow very anemically. So how to moderate, how to balance world That's it. growth? Balance. So how to balance? Exactly. I think this is the challenge, exactly. how to balance. But yeah. uh, we could go <laughs> deeper into it later. Yeah. We, I'll, we will get that. Um, let me turn now on to social policies for inclusion. And I'm going to ask uh, now Felipe Cast, who's the Minister of um, uh, Planning and Cooperation in, in Chile. Uh, Felipe, um, as, um, as Minister Cindia uh, also, is a, is a PhD graduate from uh, Harvard. So he has to, uh, has a lot of responsibility on his shoulders, uh, a reputation to protect. Um, uh, Chile is, is uh, uh, um, the development star of Latin America. It is also the third most unequal country in Latin America. And this comes as a puzzle to many people because uh, the country has done so well and because it comes from 20 years of a center-left government uh, that has been obsessed about inequality and inclusion in, in, um, in Chile. So now you have um, a center-right uh, coalition uh, that uh, is in power, and it's uh, trying to improve on the performance of inclusion uh, in, uh, in, in Chile. Um, there are major ideological issues around this. Uh, there are some people who like uh, uh, to have targeted programs on the poor. There are other people who prefer to have universal rights that reach to the poor and everybody so that they'll be perceived as more legitimate. There are, there's the perception that a lot can be done after incomes get generated to be redistributed, but others are concerned, what about the inequality before incomes are generated so that the, the market outcome is, is more inclusive and empowering and, and less unequalizing. So you have to deal with these issues and come up with concrete policies. What, what have you learned and what are you doing? Well, thank you, Ricardo, for the invitation. And um, <clears throat> I will say that actually there is a lot of myth around this issue of uh, what is the real goal we are trying to reach in, in the case of, of social policy. And I think it's like before we start doing something, you need to be clear where you want to be. Um, so one thing we are, we everybody probably agrees is that you want to uh, eradicate poverty, right? Everybody will agree that we want zero poverty around the world. But the second question about inequality and what is inclusion is, I think, is a harder question. Because um, probably, and, and, and my vision is that probably we should worry more about social mobility. But nonetheless, we don't measure social mobility very often. So the ideology that you have, it should uh, influence a lot in the way you behave. And so far, we, in Latin America, we usually measure poverty and we measure inequality. But I don't see around many people or many countries measuring very seriously uh, equal opportunities or what are the, because you can have a very unequal country with a lot of social mobility and I'm pretty sure that everybody will be uh, pretty happy or much happier than what uh, we are in Chile. So the problem with inequality is not so much inequality itself, is that we know that actually inequality it reflects a different problem. It reflects that actually we have unfair societies. So the people that actually was born in the wrong place probably is going to be in that wrong place for a long time. So the fight that we are having in Chile right now is actually in to change the language and actually focus more attention into education and to fo focus more attention into what will make us a society with more social mobility. That's just on the one hand. It probably it will take time to do that. But in January, we just approved a big reform in education. But the second thing is also a big issue because actually we are from the, as you said, more from the center right. And now we're trying to redistribute a lot. And there is a big myth that actually if you redistribute, you will actually reduce growth. Um, and so everybody is saying, you know, you, you shouldn't redistribute that much because you can uh, harm the incentive for growth. 
And I will say that so far right now, with all the evidence we have around the world, you can't redistribute in a, in a smart way. So it's not true, I think, anymore that you cannot redistribute and to make a, a, a country without poverty harming growth. On the opposite, actually, the evidence, empirical evidence on conditional cash transfers suggests that actually you need to release the budget constraints on a family in order to help them to go beyond poverty in a sustainable way. So um, I, will, I am totally in favor of targeting social policies because actually we have a lot of inequality and if you want to reduce inequality through social policy, you need, you need to actually allocate some resources on the poorest people. On the other hand, I think we are, redistributing, re we are not redistributing a lot. So I think we are, uh, in a way, we are locked by ideology and, some, and sometimes. And I, I think it's related to the quality of our social policies, so, our social policies. So right now, you do have the instruments and the evidence to, to design a good way of redistributing without actually, actually you can put incentive to graduate from poverty. The big problem, I think, right now, actually, for, for the enterprises is that right now, we are, as, a, as a government, we cannot reduce poverty in a sustainable way without the help of businesses. And let me, put you an, uh, let me give you an example. Right now, if you ask me what is the biggest wish you have, I have, as a minister for my country, give me 100,000 jobs that are flexible, right? I need flexible jobs. I know what poverty is about in Latin America. These uh, women cannot get out of their, their towns because they, they need to spend a lot of money to pay transportation, actually. Uh, so the easiest way for me is to uh, dialogate with the businesses man, and tell them, you know what, we need to design uh, jobs for these girls, for these women. And right now, I, that's, if you ask me what is your biggest constraint, is flexible jobs. And, Flexible jobs, formal jobs. Right now, um, when you ask a, a, a woman, can you find a job, for example, in Chile, for the minimum wage, they will say yes. Well, why, so then, why are you not taking this job? And they will tell you, you know what, because if I, want, if I go outside of my house, I will have to spend about 40% of this salary just to get out of my house. So then you have this kind of, you need to be more, in, in, kind of more creative in order to, to, to solve this kind of problem. And let me finish with one more thing. I think we are not thinking outside of the box enough in the following way. Right now, um, social policy, it shouldn't be only about poverty, inequality, and the more typical things. We should think deeper about other issues as happiness and other things because um, if you ask, and if, you, if you run surveys, you will find that actually, um, at least in some countries in Latin America, the people doesn't feel as far away from the rest as you may think. So right now, happiness and social policies that are more innovative could help you a lot in order to increase the sense of equality. So right now, equality, equality of consumption actually is much better than income inequality. Right? If you, if you ask the, the way you dress, the, the drives your car, it's, it's, it's closer. The big problem of inequality in most of our countries is the inequality on dreams. So if you ask people, how far you can dream in your life, then you will find a huge gap. And I think we should tackle that question more often. Very, very interesting. Um, let me move now on to uh, Reynaldo Garcia. Reynaldo is uh, the president and CEO of General Electric uh, of Latin America and of Brazil. Uh, General Electric is, uh, you know, uh, somewhat of a medium-sized company uh, <laughs> that is uh, very focused on everything. Uh, they do energy, <laughs> uh, they do health, uh, they do many, many, they do technologies in, in many fields. So it's a global company. It's important in every single Latin American country. Uh, um, and it's a company uh, that is seeing us, it's seeing the possibilities in the region, is concerned about uh, how it's going to accompany our growth, and it's also thinking about the inclusiveness aspects of it. So I would like to, uh, for you to share your thoughts uh, with us. Thanks, Ricardo. I thought you were going to say General Electric is a mid-sized country. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, I think uh, when you think about 
economic inclusiveness or inclusive economic growth, uh, it's important to think about uh, what can help get out of it. So simple, basic things I would say, education, investment in education is absolutely crucial. You know, it's uh, uh, pretty, pretty obvious the correlation of the illiteracy and uh, mass poverty and also the opposite, the large investments in education and in rapid economic growth. Healthcare, a healthy person is more able to produce and more able to, is more able to consume and to save, right? And then the environment where the, the poor would work, okay? Thinking about uh, getting economic inclusiveness, it means getting the poor to move to the middle class, to getting the poor to participate in the economic uh, aspects of, uh, of, of the country, of, of life. So you got to work on the productivity side of the, of, of the individual, okay? So e education, healthcare, and the competitiveness of the environment where that person works is absolutely critical. And when you think about that, competitiveness, ease of doing business in the country, infrastructure availability. So all of these things will impact the productivity of the worker, okay? So in these three areas, uh, GE is, uh, General Electric is very concerned. Uh, on the education side, the GE spends more than a billion dollars globally. And a, a portion of that in the countries in Latin America. Uh, we are going to open a training center right here in Rio to train people for the company, but also train technical people for the economy. This is a different way, different approach, never done this anywhere. We always train people to work for us. We will train people for the market, and we would invite other companies to join this effort because I think this is one of the important bottlenecks in this country right now in this geography, in this region, in terms of uh, availability of technical competence. Now, healthcare is actually one of our businesses, so we are very passionate about providing technology and solutions to the healthcare challenges, but really in a very uh, localized approach, in fact. Uh, the concern uh, of access, which has a lot to do with inclusiveness in the economy, how do you, how do you take health care to people in rural areas is an, is an important aspect uh, that we've got to think about, and we have been investing and getting very nice results in this, in the sense of we talk about mobility in many parts of the world. A person that needs care, uh, health care may need to walk 50 kilometers to a, uh, a place to receive care. So if you can invert that and actually take the care to the individuals with portable technologies, this is very important. We have done a lot of this. In fact, we have now technologies that are able to assess uh, uh, conditions of the individual the size of a mobile phone, okay? And then on the infrastructure side is uh, to create the environment where the individual can be then competitive, very, very critical, and a large portion of our business are dedicated to this, whether we're talking about energy, or oil and gas, transportation, and aviation. So uh, uh, in, in that regard, in trying to be very cognizant and uh, adaptive to the realities of the region, we have also made a decision to establish a uh, very important research center right here in the city of Rio, uh, which is the fifth one in the world. The first one was opened by Thomas Edison more than 100 years ago in Schenectady by the way, the first city to be illuminated by light. Uh, and then we open another one in Bangalore, Shanghai, Munich, and now in the city of Rio. So these, uh, uh, we believe that there is a nice convergence of uh, needs, technologies, and if you can get people to partic participate in the economy more fully, there will be more and great economic growth. So I think some of the issues that you're talking about, Brazil growing only 4.5%, if there's greater participation of all in that economic growth, it should not be necessarily only 4.5%. Very good. Uh, so uh, now we're going to move on to George um, Ab Abraham, uh, who's the president of uh, Ethos Institute for Business and Social Responsibility. Um, George sees and looks at all the corporate social responsibility practices of the private sector in Brazil and sees uh, what are the uh, interesting things that people are creating, happening, framing. So I would like uh, if you could share with us what do you think are sort of like the best practices uh, to ensure what's the contribution that the corporate sector can do uh, to inclusive growth. 
é, em 12 horas. Ok. Obrigado, Ricardo. Boa tarde a todas e todos. É, eu creio que nós estejamos assim diante de um problema é, de tal dimensão que, é, em relação às soluções que temos em caminhar como empresas, como governo, como sociedade civil, é, que merece uma reflexão que o nosso, que o Instituto Etos está propondo um, um novo, uma nova forma de reflexão que eu queria dividir com vocês rapidamente. É, isso passa por uma mudança da questão da relação entre público e privado. É, quer dizer, não, não, na, na, nesta visão, não dá mais para as empresas é, defenderem os seus interesses diante do público e o público e o setor público somente defender os interesses públicos sem considerar o privado. Quer dizer, há um processo em que as empresas propõem um, algo que, que de interesse público. E, e o Estado entende essa proposição das empresas como algo de interesse público. Eu estou querendo dizer o seguinte, estamos desenvolvendo uma plataforma conjunta, o Etos, com grandes empresas, que, na verdade, está propondo uma transição da economia e que considera, sobretudo, o interesse público. E o governo, de alguma forma, que o Estado percebe que pode ter um grande aliado que são as empresas, de uma forma geral. Porque esses interesses podem coincidir tamanha a dimensão do problema que nós estamos vivendo. Essa plataforma é uma plataforma que está sendo chamada de plataforma é, inclusiva, verde e responsável, que considera três pilares, que é o pilar da social, o pilar é, ambiental e o pilar ético, de integridade. Na nossa visão, não basta mais... É, crescer. Não basta crescer de uma forma verde, não basta crescer de uma forma verde e considerando o social. Tem que se integrar todas essas questões com as questões de integridade das relações privado-privado e privado-público. E é essa discussão que nós estamos tentando fazer e trazer de uma forma geral para a sociedade, integrando as dimensões das empresas, da sociedade civil, dos trabalhadores e do governo para que possamos criar uma plataforma, uma agenda que possa avançar diante da, do desafio do desenvolvimento sustentável. É, eu queria avançar dizendo que, nesse, nessa, como nós estamos num painel da inclusão, eu queria abordar rapidamente a questão da inclusão. É, no Brasil, recentemente, nós tivemos um êxito nos últimos anos em relação à questão social. Todos sabemos que, uma, uma, a, na verdade, uma integração de políticas de salário mínimo, de, de, de crédito, é, de geração de emprego, redundou numa, numa, numa grande, digamos assim, é, em, em uma grande, com 30 milhões de brasileiros passando para a classe média. Bem, este é, é, movimento, entretanto, ocorreu, e ele ocorreu dentro da faixa dos trabalhadores, de quem tem renda, e isso foi importante para o país. Agora eu queria colocar alguns desafios aqui para a nossa reflexão sobre a questão do problema de questões estruturantes, porque isso é uma questão que aconteceu, foi uma questão importante, teve uma dimensão uh, das empresas, do governo, foi, foi algo exemplar que ocorreu aqui dentro do Brasil. Mas há alguns desafios estruturantes, por exemplo, aumentar questões que sejam perenes para nós e, e, e que nós poderíamos pensar em como efetivamente estar avançando. Aumentar a participação do trabalho na renda nacional. Porque quando nós falamos da questão da redução da desigualdade, é dentro da faixa da renda do trabalho. Nós não conseguimos ainda no nosso país é, mudar a equação entre renda do trabalho e a questão da renda do capital. Isso é algo que nós deveríamos, porque para avançar na sustentabilidade, efetivamente nós vamos ter que enfrentar esse problema. A questão tributária, a questão tributária no Brasil, e falo no Brasil porque acho que serve como exemplo também para outros locais. Se nós, de alguma forma, não enfrentarmos a questão tributária, encararmos a questão tributária como uma ferramenta de justiça nessa questão da inclusão, também não conseguiremos avançar em demasia. Do ponto de vista de 
fomentar um novo padrão na questão educação, na questão de comportamento, fomentar um novo padrão de consumo. É algo que nós vamos ter que, como sociedade, enfrentar. No Brasil, aqui nós temos um importante instituto que trata do, do, da questão do consumo consciente, chamado Instituto Acatu, que tem trabalhos excepcionais nessa área do consumo. E é algo que as empresas têm que ter um olhar e o governo cada vez mais acentuado para isso. É, na questão de produção, a, a, que nós consideremos é, é que tipo de... O Luciano colocava a questão do desenvolvimento e o grande investimento que tem feito no Brasil e é uma, e, e, e é uma realidade nossa. Hoje em dia o BNDES investe muito mais, sabemos, do que o Banco Mundial. Mas é, que tipo de desenvolvimento queremos? Que condicionantes colocamos nesses tipos de nesses investimentos? Que condicionante ambiental, que condicionante social, que condicionante de transparência devemos inserir para que possamos avançar nessa agenda de uma forma geral? Criar uma formalização de uma, da economia, da, das pequenas em, empresas de uma forma geral, isso é fundamental para o nosso país. Pensar em regulamentações especiais para essas áreas que são grandes geradoras de emprego e podem, na verdade, resolver muitos dos nossos problemas sociais. As empresas, de uma forma geral, têm tido um papel fundamental nesse processo. Elas têm investido, elas têm considerado as questões ambientais, têm uma visão de longo prazo, têm influenciado em políticas públicas e isso tem sido um exemplo no país. Nós tivemos recentemente uma questão que acho que alguns de vocês conhecem, mas é a questão climática no país, foi fundamental a atuação das empresas. Nós só conseguimos ter políticas públicas nas questões de mudança climática graças à ação de empresas que assumiram compromissos voluntariamente e levaram ao governo. E o governo, sentindo-se respaldado com isso, assumiu propostas avançadas e fez com que o Brasil hoje seja uma vanguarda do ponto de vista nas questões ambientais. E gerou uma política de mudanças climáticas muito importante para o Brasil. Brasil. Hoje nós já estamos pensando nessas questões de estabelecer metas setoriais para que possam os setores é, é, ter metas de redução, o que poucos países estão fazendo. E esse tipo de exemplo nós deveríamos incorporar para as questões sociais e também para as questões de transparência. E finalizo, finalizo dizendo que o Brasil, é, creio, tem uma grande oportunidade hoje, todos sabemos. A oportunidade de grandes eventos que nós teremos. Nós teremos aqui a Rio Mais 20, que não é um evento de grande investimento, mas é um evento importante do ponto de vista político para para para, na verdade, se discutir a questão do desenvolvimento sustentável. Temos investimentos grandes da Copa e da Olimpíada. A visão que deve preponderar não é que nós temos que fazer um bons eventos. É o legado que esses eventos deixam para a nossa população. E isso inverte a equação. Se nós considerarmos como empresas, governo, sociedade civil, construir um ambiente que permita que um legado seja deixado de uma forma geral para a população, nós estaremos aproveitando uma oportunidade que já perdemos em muitos outros momentos no nosso país. Grandes investimentos foram feitos, mas o processo foi de concentração e nós não conseguimos, é, na verdade, resolver esse problema de inclusão que é fundamental para um país como o nosso. A sociedade civil vai ter um papel fundamental nisso, que é de convergência. Nós não precisamos mais de grandes ideias. Nós precisamos atuar numa questão de convergir, de reunir, para poder tirar o que é comum entre, entre as entidades da sociedade civil, que tem, na verdade, muitos projetos pela frente. As empresas, do ponto de vista das empresas, elas estão sendo exemplo, como eu quis dizer, muitas delas com uma visão de longo prazo e propostas voluntárias de ações nas questões ambientais e sociais e de transparência, por que não dizer, e o governo propondo diretrizes para essas questões e atuando nas suas empresas como casos exemplares também nas questões sociais e ambientais. Acho que com isso nós poderíamos construir, e cabe a todos nós, construir uma agenda propositiva para estar, para estar, na verdade, levando a uma transição dessa economia que tanto desejamos. Né? Obrigado. Obrigado yeah. muito. Bem, Uh, another another round. I'm I'm going to go to the floor and see if there are some questions out there before I go back uh, to the panel. So uh, I don't see so any hands. There's a hand back there. I don't see any other hand, and there's another hand back there. So I'm, I'm going to go to those two, and then I'll go back to the yes. 
This is a question for mainly for Mr. Cast and Mr. Cindia. You have talked about the role of government on achieving inclusive growth. Um, I want to ask you, do you think there's a role of companies in achieving inclusive growth? And if there is, what do you think it is? Okay. Yes, I'm Sergio Sarmiento from Mexico. If we look at the figures uh, that uh, over the past few years, over the past few decades, we'll find out that uh, um, hundreds of millions of people have come out of poverty in places like China or India, in countries like Chile as well, in fact, or in countries like Brazil. Uh, however, uh, inequality remains very large, and in some cases it has been uh, increased. In China, in fact, we have more inequality right now. We have maybe 400 uh, million people who've come out of poverty. Wouldn't it be that uh, in order to get really inclusive growth and really to actually fight poverty, we should forget a bit about the uh, myths of in, uh, inequality and try to concentrate on fighting poverty? Uh, very good. Uh, I'm going to now go back to the panel. There's, uh, so there's a, a question of what, what businesses can do for, uh, for inclusion uh, to, to, to people in the public sector, even though I thought that a theme that they both had expressed was the need for, for, for cooperation between them. Before I do that, let me go a little bit back to the macro. Um, uh, there is a difference <clears throat> when the world grows because there is 1% um, uh, of the growth is explained, say, by the U.S., of global growth is explained by the U.S., and when 1% of global growth is explained by China or by India. Because when, 1 when the U.S. grows by 1%, it's consumers that are on an income per capita of $50,000 a year. When it's a consumer in India or in China, it's a consumer at $5,000 a year or at $1,000 a year. They have completely different consumption patterns. They eat more food, they need more energy, they need more housing, and it's a completely different pattern of production. And what, one of the things that has happened is that they demand more of the things that Brazil has. Um, so Brazil has been, Brazil and South America in general have been increasingly integrated to, uh, to this dynamism of, of Asian growth. So part of the limits to Asian growth is the speed at which uh, Brazil and South America can fill in the needs of that growing uh, world uh, so that they can grow without uh, uh, creating too much global inflation that slows everybody else down. Uh, so I want to go very quickly um, through um, 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 Mr. Coutinho, uh, Minister Cindia, and, and Bill Rhodes, if they can tell us in 35 seconds, okay? <laughs> um, uh, what about what you're doing is eliminating these constraints on growth that will allow uh, the world and your societies uh, to, uh, to, to grow faster with this pattern of growth that is uh, dominated by the dynamics at the bottom. <coughs> Luciana wants me to start off. I would just like to say that I think the role of the private sector working uh, in these areas of infrastructure and the other points that were mentioned here are key to growth. Education, <coughs> technology, environment, you can't just talk about the, uh, and, and Luciano mentioned this when he was talking about infrastructure, infrastructure with Brazil. It was also mentioned by others. I think it's key. It's got to be a partnership here. The, the public sector can't do it by itself. And so I think inclusion here of the private sector is really uh, key uh, to, uh, to growth. And I think we have a good example, if you want to use it. We keep throwing around China. I mentioned it. You did. Uh, the Luciano did. But one of the things is, remember, when China opened up uh, its economy is when you start getting the growth. And uh, the minister from India mentioned 1991, which is what happened also in India. And so I think that these dynamics, I think, are very, very important to, uh, to growth going forward. And uh, I think that also has a lot to do with, with equality and poverty alleviation. I mean, they're all kind of put together. And you do need a balance in this. And if you go uh, too much to one side or the other, that's when you get uh, the problem, including growth and inflation. You've got to have some balance here. That's a problem for my country right now, the United States of America. So. Minister Coutinho. 
Well, I, I would add that uh, one big priority should be increase in supply, particularly food supply. I think one big priority for the G20 orientation for the globe would be increasing, accelerate food supply. Because this is one particularly important issue for, for economic inclusion, globally speaking. And I think we, of course, we in Brazil uh, are going to promote that because we need and we, we can contribute to global exports of foodstuffs and protein. And I think many c developing countries could do also. This is a big opportunity. And also in the case of energy, we have to be more efficient in use of energy because this is increased supply of energy is not so easy. So I think we, sh we should address priorities to global growth. And I do agree with you that the profile of growth is different. And of course, and also, therefore, it's not just a question of mitigating the rate of growth, because we may be growing too much, should moderate growth, but also we should accelerate supply of the key uh, items for economic inclusion. Very good. Minister Sindhya? So, Ricardo, you've asked a politician to tell you something in 35 seconds. Is that possible? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to try. Uh, a colleague of uh, my late father once gave me a piece of advice which I've tried to follow in life. Which uh, He said, always remember, uh, a politician's popularity is always inversely proportional to the length of his speech. So, <laughs> so I'm going to try and, and stick to that. Uh, a very pertinent question. Um, how do you ensure that countries and continents like South America are continuously able to provide that pipeline of raw material to be able to grow uh, for Asian economies. I, I believe there are three fundamentals to that. The first is efficiency. Uh, I think in countries like India have a lot to learn from countries like Brazil in terms of being efficient, especially in the areas of agriculture. Uh, we have a huge dichotomy in India today, which is that Agriculture contributes close to about 14% of our GDP, but 70% of our labor workforce is engaged in agriculture. That dichotomy cannot last for long. Efficiency there is, is important. Today we are the world's largest producer of milk at 100 million tons. We are the world's second largest producer of fruit and vegetables at 150 million tons. We are the world's third largest producer of food grain at 240 million tons. That's the asset side of the balance sheet. But there's also a liability side. The liability side is that 30% of these commodities end up being going into wastage. Only 5% of these commodities get produced. So if we take what Brazil has done in the last 10, 15 years through institutions like Impraba in terms of huge amounts of efficiency in productivity, taking much more arable land into production, making sure that post-production processes are in place so as to add value to those commodities, I think you can do a lot of good by getting that efficiency in. On the second issue, I don't think uh, in terms of increasing our country's possibilities, just purely efficiency is good enough. It's important to be able to train your workforce. Education is important, but I firmly believe that even more important than education sometimes is skilling. Are we actually skilling our population for the demand of the jobs that's out there? There's no point producing a graduate if you can't give that graduate a job. It's more important to be able to skill that person so that he can get employment and add value. So I think in terms of skill training, that's another in initiative that my government is taking extremely seriously. We put a billion dollars together within a PPP model to try and promote vocational training institutes right down to the grassroots level. I tried. <laughs> very good. A few more seconds than 32, but uh, very substantive. Uh, Minister. Felipe Cast, uh, you captivated the audience with this idea of inequality of dreams. How are you going to conquer that one? Well, first of all, I think if, if you take seriously uh, equal opportunities, I opportunities about dreams. Um, if you take seriously a huge reform of education, uh, if, you if you really come back to politics in a good way, most of the problems we're facing in Chile are not due to uh, lack of good ideas. 
are mostly due that that politics was not able to to make things done in, at the right moment. So, um, if you think a little bit about uh, the way you design a social policy, you should shift from just transferring uh, money, which is something that you usually should do, towards something that will actually put into a, into the floor, into the in, into, into the lowest part of the pyramid, um, the dreams. And in, in terms of education, what we are doing right now, um, and actually I see um, Tomas Ricard around here, he's a social entrepreneur who actually is doing that right now with the help of the government, by himself, and he is basically promoting the best students of, the, of Chile, the best professional, to dedicate their life to, towards, to be teachers, T like Teaching for America, but in Chile, in Latin America, on the other hand, we are putting together, we have a huge new generation of young people that actually are moving towards uh, politics and towards kind of taking care of inequality in Chile in a deeper way, with a new way of doing it. Trying to bridge together this idea that a country like Chile, which is, has huge inequality, the only ones who actually can actually make a credible promise are the young people. So if the new generation is the one taking care of politics, as me, I'm the youngest minister in America, some people say. Um, I'm 33. Uh, if we take care of inequality, seriously, in a new way, like leaving aside the old fights between left and right, and putting in front empirical evidence, good, well-designed well social policies, I think we can uh, put together the best of the academia, but with the urgency of young generations and with the urgency of good politics. I think if you put together both, at the end of the day, you will get a quick result. Let me ask um, uh, Ricardo. Can, can I ask answer yeah. the question on uh, what companies can do for inclusive growth? Sure. Because I think that's a question that came from from yeah. the audience. Uh, I think companies have a fundamental role in inclusive growth. And how is that? First is a direct way. It's only when companies in the private sector really grow that you're able to provide government with the resources to be to be able to direct itself to a social agenda. The reason why, for example, spending in India on education, on health care, all the issues that uh, uh, my good friend here from GE talked about has grown four or five times in the last six to seven years is because corporate profits have grown, companies have grown uh, in a huge manner in India. And therefore, from a taxation point of view, you actually got that watches together when your country was growing at eight and a half percent to be able to fund these social initiatives. That's the direct way. But there's also an indirect way, which is as important. And I'm going to give you the example of telecom in my country. When I graduated from your university and went back home for the first time in 1994, there was not a single mobile phone in my country. Mobile phones did not exist in India. In a period of 17 years, from 1994 to 2011, you have grown from zero penetration of mobile phones in India to 67% of mobile penetration. Now that's in terms of percentage. In terms of numbers, here's the shocker. You've grown from zero mobile phones to 750 million mobile phones as of December 2010, in 17 years. What does that do? I come from a rural constituency. My parliamentary constituency is predominantly rural, right? Today, farmers in my constituency, which covers close to about 3,000 villages, all of them are connected by mobile telephony, connected by internet, access to information, which information means money, means opportunity, aspirations, dreams. That's available today at the grassroots level in India, which was not the case 15 years ago. So there's a hell of a lot that the corporate sector can do. Okay. Yes, Felipe. A very short story, just to give you a, a good example of how this equality of of dreams comes come true. Yesterday, actually, I was in Islam in, in the north of Chile, and we were starting a new problem that's called uh, Ingreso Etico Familiar, which is probably is, is very well known, but Magali, who was the, she was the mother of, of a 16 years old, no, she was 26 years old, no, 22 years old. Magali was the mother of uh, Susan. And what impressed me is that Magali was living in Islam, she was very poor, but Susan, she was 22, and she was the first generation in the university. And Magali felt not poor anymore, 
not because of the consumption she was getting every day, but because she was able to put her daughter into a better place. So if, if you're able to, to make a mother feeling at the beginning of the, of the life of a child that this child is going to get, get a, a better education and a better situation, but a huge, a, a, a larger, a really uh, better situation, you will make the, the, the daily life for this mother uh, extremely different, as opposed to just giving a transfer that this will help a lot, but it won't be, uh, it won't have uh, the same impact on happiness as what you will get from increasing just consumption. Well, um, you urgent thing? No, I just wanted yeah. to add to this because it's yeah. just not just access to, to public essential goods, but like education, like the chance, but it is qualification for job, for work. This is a, a, a bottleneck. So we have to address beyond, beyond education, how to, in a very concrete way, train people for grabbing opportunities. Okay. So that's, that's something that it is very dear okay. now in, in our case, uh, including tomorrow there will be a big announcement by, by President Dilma in, in this direction for training for, for, for jobs. That's so just a, a, yeah. a point that was made. Very good. Well, uh, our time is up. Let me, let me summarize uh, in, in 30 seconds uh, what I think was the consensus of this, of this group. Uh, there is a division in the Americas, a uh, rather deep division in the Americas in, in the way that different countries are looking at their future. I, I come from the other side, and uh, that other side is based on the idea that social progress is based on a class struggle. That confrontation between elements of society is the way societies move forward. It's by one class overcoming uh, the other class and finding opportunities to clash. What I think was the consensus of this, of this group, both from India, from Brazil, the US, uh, and Chile, is that there are enormous opportunities for cooperation. That if companies behave ethically, as Mr. Abraham was saying, on environmental issues, on social issues, on their corporate responsibility, that they can be perceived as more legitimate members of the society by the government. That to the extent that the government can exploit the opportunities of cooperation in, 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 in leveraging the possibilities of the social, uh, of, the, of the private sector to train people, to incorporate people, to create jobs, to create opportunities, that the government is going to be more effective. So that the, the, the whole space of inclusive growth is about creating opportunities for win-win interactions between all the members of society. And I would put it to you that the approach of win-win uh, um, uh, strategies uh, is trying to deliver more effectiveness than the alternative. Thank you very much.